Right, we are on this time. Good. Pleasure to have you, Charlie. Pleasure to have you on the podcast. Mate, you uh, we were talking there uh, just before we started. Um, book. Yeah, you were you were thinking about writing a book, or you have started writing a book? Um, I would say probably have started. Um, probably. Sorry, just pull it. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Right. Yeah, probably about, um, ooh, I would say probably the summer of 2018. Um, it was more originally for, uh, I guess, processing um, everything that sort of happened. Um, you know, I've obviously sort of talked about it with um, friends, family, talked about it on like sort of the media, I guess we'll call it. Um, it was more, you know, really sort of diving into it, really sort of taking into account what happened that night. Um, and then obviously sort of processing, you know, sort of, I guess how it's changed you perhaps, um, and how it's sort of affected you, you know, especially after sort of the recovery side of things in terms of, you know, being in hospital, um, and just really sort of an, almost like an evalu- a large evaluation of yourself, um, taking into account, you know, the impact that it's had on, on you, your, your family as well. Um, and then sort of, you know, some good bits in there as well, not sort of all down and dreary and things like that, you know, sort of, um, again, mainly about what happened. Um, but yeah, looking at the positive side of things as well, it's all these sort of, a uh, events recognition uh just all those things that you think that would never happen in, in my life that like was sort of uh different um as i said like events and uh things i got to go to really as well so um that sort of helped a lot um especially sort of occupying my time off work as well and then i guess by the time i sort of thought oh that's all right it was then sort of more about you know, your own life and things like that. Um, and yeah, it's just sort of something sort of dipped in quite a lot. Uh, not so much recently really, but I guess it's something I can always come back to as sort of a, a project maybe later on when there's more things to write about perhaps. Yeah. They, they, I think the, when people, they, there was always books come out about di- different incidents and different things. People did books for different reasons, right? I think some people see them as quite self-serving rightly or wrongly, depending on the intent of it. But I think people often miss the point that it's not, it's not always about, um, you know, oh, look at me, look at my story. It's very often, especially with traumatic stuff, it's very often about a, a method or part of the method of processing what went on for the person who experienced it. Because especially when you're talking about writing, I think it's like, it's almost an art that's sort of getting forgotten, I think. But it, it causes, when, you, when, you, when you're trying to put a story into words, in, or into a different medium, it often gets you to, think a bit deeper about it below, you know, that first level and helps you sort of understand a bit more. Um, what was the date? What date did it happen? Uh, so it would have been the 3rd of June, 2017. What Champions League match were you watching? I've, I read it. Oh, <laughs> so it would have been, I want to say Real Madrid, Juventus, and the result was 4-1. Um, yeah, I didn't remember what the result was when I, when I eventually woke up. Um, but I do remember my uh, bet I had that night, uh, which didn't come through. So that's the main thing I sort of remember from that. Talk through it. Talk, th- talk through the day, mate. What, um, had you been working at all that day? Uh, yeah. So we had, um, it was sort of like this new thing that was introduced whereby, um, you know, you would work sort of in between, I guess, the original shifts that people long. So we do like sort of earlies, lates and nights. Uh, so it was like a 10 till 6, I think, or something like that, which, is like, which, which we wouldn't normally do. Um, and that was only because I went out the previous night. So I wanted, obviously, a bit of a lay-in and things like that as well. So, um, so there was like four of us from our team on that day. Um, we had sort of a couple of incidents that were quite, I guess, um, not the norm, really. Um, I guess something that you sort of go, like, if you have like days that are sometimes quite light, uh, this was quite like a heavy day. I mean, not at the time because at the time you're sort of just doing your job. You're just sort of continuing on. You don't really sort of, I don't want to say pay much attention to it, but you don't sort of let it really sort of affect you or you don't want to because obviously if everything affected you, you, you wouldn't get anywhere really. Um, so I think we were sort of, you know, I was just planning on going home really that night and then 
uh, just one of the people just mentioned about going to the pub. I was like, yeah, go on in. I might as well. Saturday night. Um, and yeah, the football was on. So it's like a reason. That's a reason enough to go out, I think. Uh, so yeah, we decided to, to go out that night. Go on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's not where the light finished yet. No, 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 no. <laughs> and that's the end of the story. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we went to, um, went to a pub. It was sort of, for the people who don't really know, it wasn't really sort of London Bridge, Borough Market way. It was more sort of the Elephant and Castle sort of way. So a bit further down, a bit further down Borough High Street, basically. Can't remember the name of the pub. Uh, but I do remember they were serving a Ranji Boom on tap, which I haven't seen in ages. So I thought, yeah, go on then. So the first one went down very well. Second one went down very well. Third, fourth, fifth, sixth. I believe it was seven. I don't know if it's off of my head. Um, and yes, obviously having, having a couple, having a, oh, say a couple, having a few beers and just watching the football. So obviously the people I was with, I think there ended up being about sort of eight of us, seven or eight of us at the time. Um, and we all sort of parted ways at different times, really. Um, and you know, my sort of usual walk back um, to London Bridge, so obviously get a train home that night. So, again, just like London night, London nightlife, Saturday night. You know, I thought it was actually quite quiet, considering the football's been on, and it was obviously June, so obviously fairly warm. Um, I think the horse racing has been on at Epsom or somewhere like that as well. I can't remember which one it was. Um, so yeah, walking back. Um, usually, I would have my earphones in, listen to music things like that, just sort of, I can just almost like space out from like what's going, what's happening around me. Uh, obviously being aware of some of what's going on. Uh, didn't have them on me. Must have left them in my locker for the first time ever. Um, so yeah, I was just walking back. Um, sort of came up to uh, more sort of the Borough Market way um, near the sort of railway line. And it was pretty much just sort of, you know, just straight away, just like someone like, oh, like shouting pretty much, help, I've been stabbed. Where, in the street? In the street, yeah. So sort of heard the noise, looked over to my left, just seen someone basically holding their arm and sort of gradually sort of fall to the floor. And I guess it was. So first thought came to my mind was, fuck, because... I probably have to do something about this. I can't really sort of go, ah, uh, just let that go. It's fine. You know, you sort of have a responsibility to some extent to do something. It doesn't have to be sort of miracle first aid, but, oh, maybe this person needs some help. Maybe let's call the police and let's call the ambulance. So that was sort of my initial sort of reaction to it. As much as I probably didn't want to do it, but I just wanted to go home. So I've run across the road. Um, as soon as I got over there, basically this girl's just basically put her phone in like to, towards me, and I could see it was ringing nine nine nine. Um, so I've just sort of just okay, fair enough that you've done my job for me already. Was this the girl that got stabbed? Uh, I don't believe so. I I don't know. Was who it someone this, else? I I right. don't know who this person would be. Um. So, yeah, just sort of, you know, just kept it quite basic. It was pretty much, uh, Mal's been stabbed on Borough High Street, opposite pret a uh, Police and ambulance gave about the phone. That's, that's enough, really, for them to sort of go, okay, there's a call about it. And then I thought, okay, well, I'll use my phone now and try and obviously contact them as well. So as I was sort of dialed it, things like that. Um, and I never called 999 before. So I didn't really know. I just assumed it just went straight through to someone. It doesn't. Uh, so what request, what uh, service do you require? Didn't, didn't know that at all. So I just sort of, again, said exactly the same things I did before. Uh, like police and ambulance here, here and here. Um, and then I'm assuming it was sending me through to some place, someone. Um, but basically as it came through, um, 
that's when the British Transport Police came. So there was two of them. So Wayne and Leon. So Wayne Marks, Leon McLeod uh, came over. Um, just sort of got me warrant card out. Just like, oh yeah, I'm a police officer and all that sort of stuff. So, um, and just very briefly, it was just like, yeah, he's just been stabbed. That's that's all really new. And there was, should have mentioned, there was someone actually, what looked like they were doing first aid on him, sort of like putting pressure on like his arm. So I guess I was like, that's sort of covered as well. It's just more sort of, you know, just trying to figure out what's what's really happened. Because obviously at this time we have no idea what's going on. What actually is going, literally 100 metres away from us, we have no idea what is actually going on. So we sort of, I don't think we've even talked at all for uh, within like 10, 15 seconds. Um, there was like sort of an alleyway. I guess that sort of leads into the market. Um, just almost like this group of like six, seven people just came out and we just sort of thought, well, I just sort of thought, oh, it's just like a fight. Maybe it's something to do with this. So oh, there was like a right commotion then. With the, with this. Uh, I mean, nothing from, I guess from a policing standpoint, from things that you see, nothing out of the ordinary, you know, someone like who doesn't work in that environment, would be, oh my God, there's a fight going on. There's a fight going on. So you're quite sort of relaxed and chilled about it almost to a certain extent. So I've just seen, I will, I've just seen Wayne go over um, and whatever reason, just gone and followed him. Whether it was just out of, out of instinct, just no sort of like, like he's gone, you just go because that's what you do in the shop. You, there's danger. You don't run. You go to it. Now, if I hadn't have drunk that night, I don't think I would have changed. I think I've, obviously what I was talking about with Curry, I don't think I would have done anything different, to be honest. I think I still would have gone bosh, like gone into there as well. Maybe I had a bit more sort of an idea of what was happening, but I think I would have gone straight in there as well. Again, I only thought it was a fight. No, can handle myself, can sort of help out Wayne. He's got like obviously um, asp spray and all that sort of stuff. So he's got a bit of protection. He knows who I am. So chances are we're going to probably break up a fire. They'll disperse and go would be sort of the norm what would happen. So just just basically just belted it into this this group of people. Like didn't know who was who. Didn't know. You just think trying to almost put people apart, really. Um, so gone into it. And again, I don't know who I was pushing or shoving or I come if I don't think I was throwing any punches or anything like that, you know, just sort of general sort of breaking it up. Break it up. Like but with a bit of force, we'll call it. Uh reasonable, of course. Um so again, I looking back at me, I could have like pushed people who were like injured and things like that. You just you just don't know. Um so sort of again, very quickly this is all happening as well. I'm sort of slowing it down a bit. I then sort of just had almost like a glance up and I've just seen uh, Wayne basically with his ass out and he's just pretty much basically just swiping down. Asp. So it's like a baton basically, sorry. Um, or a trungeon if you want to be really sort of old school about it. It's sort of a format on that. So just seen him sort of, it's obviously, it's like racked as we call it. So it's out and he's just sort of really leveling someone so obviously there's you know a point where okay someone's obviously come for him and things like that you know again spare the moment just go out and done it um again still not really realizing what the situation was and then for whatever reason it just sort of just appeared that there was like oh three people standing in front of you with vests knives not looking particularly happy with you is the best way of putting it. And just sort of this almost like stare for like, again, a couple of seconds of, I think they were a bit shocked because it was like, what are you doing? Like, why are you coming over here? And for me, it was like, oh, you're not just having a fight. Um, you appear to be a terrorist or a group of terrorists in this situation. Um, so I guess there was sort of, you know, we have that sort of fight or flight and things like that. Um, you know, we also have freeze 
and film now, of course, the other the other F in there. Um it's that sort of like shock, I guess we'll call it. Just like, oh, it's it's that, not where we thought it was. Um and then it was sort of you're in a situation whereby, you know, I'm in this now. Can't really get away from it. You know, I've put myself into this predicament. Let's try and get out of it. Again, you sort of think, well, you know, you could have just easy. You could have just seen it and gone, belted off, and ran away. And I wouldn't have had a problem with that because I'd just done the marathon. So I could have run home and it'd been fine. Um, but again, that's just how your brain would just sort of decide in that split second what to do. And my brain decided to stay there and basically try and fight them off, I guess we'll call it. Um, what, what, were the, what vests were they wearing? So it was, it was almost like, I'm not sure if they were actual sort of stab vests or sort of, you know, protective vests as we would have. It just appeared to look in that sort of same uh, shape as well. Um, and there was definitely things on it. Even at the time, obviously it, hindsight's great. I knew sort of there, I was like, they ain't real. Like almost I think like suicide vests, that sort of thing. I was like, they don't look real. Even I've never seen one before in my life. It just didn't look real. Um, obviously not a lot of people would, you wouldn't know that, would you? You would not take that chance. Um, and then, yeah, just like obviously these long brandishing knives and things like that as well. So, Again, you sort of go, oh, it's not like, it's just a fight, is it? It's something else. So I remember sort of two of them coming towards me. I remember one like more distinctly coming towards me and things like that. And it was almost a case of, you know, I'm standing up there. He's got a knife like wrapped around his wrist. I'm just up there with my arms up because this is like how we get trained. Well, how we used to get trained. I don't know what it's like now. Put your arms up to protect your abdomen. Because obviously you get stabbed there, that's that's worse than get stabbed in your arms and things like that. So it is basically like a fighting stance. And just remember sort of like a couple of like, you know, lunges, almost like as you would have in fencing. Not because I'm posh, but I just have done fencing before. Um, sort of lunges at me, sort of like, yeah, just sort of like getting, managing to sort of get away from it. Um, I sort of, again, I'm not sure if this is just my, brain sort of um filling the gaps and things like that but i do sort of vaguely remember sort of grabbing his arm and what you basically do is you grab the arm and you push the elbow joint because then it sort of releases the hand and then it will come out now i didn't know that it was wrapped around his hand at the time well like a strap around it almost basically basically like yeah like almost if you've got like duct tape and just spread it around i think it was like some sort of like material they had wrapped around it so it didn't come out um again that that could have happened i'm I'm not entirely sure and then eventually sort of another one sort of came towards me so again my attention is now sort of drawn to two of them trying to obviously go like you're both coming for me i've now got to sort of dodge you dodge you both um so yeah i think when i was looking at the second one like two i guess more to my right the other one's sort of in the middle the one in the middle is then sort of almost like arch round and uh, got me in the back um, so, you know, at that point you're like, oh, he got me, you know, he's got me, like, okay, he's got me, okay. Um, and then, you know, this is where it's sort of, I've obviously seen it on CCTV. So my brain has it in one way and CCTV has it in another. And, uh, so I'll go for the CCTV so that's actually what happened. So it, then it looks like I get done in the back again I think by the same person how big was the blade that you're getting stabbed in the back with oh I think I think it was 9 or 12 inches Jesus it was I can't remember exactly that's um, mass- massive yeah yeah it was quite a big <laughs> a big go um, from Lidl as well that's where it came from so good advertisement for them um, so yeah it was it was weird because like you feel you feel there's no way of saying, oh, it feels like this. You know, it feels like getting stabbed. It's not like, oh, yeah, I can accommodate. I can say it's like, you know, getting a punch in the face. It's not it's like getting stabbed. Um, so you can feel it sort of going into you and things like that. But it didn't really hurt. That's probably just the adrenaline. 
going through here, or the beer, or a bit of both. So I could feel it going, but I was like, oh, that's really painful. And then it got me again. I was like, okay, I know what that feels like. You just did it. And then um, this shot, basically, when I watched it, you couldn't ask for like, if you were like a director of a film, you couldn't ask for a better shot of how it sort of appeared on screen. Because it was literally like at the outside of like a restaurant with a camera sort of pointing out the front door. And I've just basically after the second time, I've just fallen straight on my ass. Probably some just like obviously body sort of giving up or going, oh, that's actually a bit, you need to like stop, relax or whatever it will be. And then whilst this two people have been doing this, this third one somehow got round the other side of me, came back round my back and um, basically just almost like sort of 90 degrees, like one, two, three in my head. Three so that, times. Three times, yeah. So, sort of, yeah, so I've got one on the top left eye, one on the right eye, and then one down the back of my neck. Um, that, were, were you, when, he, when he did that, were you on your back, like, looking up? And no, he so came as I fell on my, so I was basically sat up as I would be, like, on a chair, on the floor, and then got me when I was on the ground. So, two things there. First of all, it's not very gentlemanly to do that. You have to be standing up for it. And again, that that did actually feel like almost like getting a, a punch in the face, but a punch in the face from maybe someone like the big show with a, who's got a, a massive fist and things like that. Um, and almost like this, your face just explodes just from, because where it hit, you know, the skin's like quite loose, especially around the eyes and things like that. It just thought this boom, like explosion almost. And, um, so yeah, that sort of dumb me in a bit there. But it was weird watching the sort of the camera footage of it. You know, I sort of, it happens again, like really quick motions. And then uh, Wayne and Leon are actually sort of dragging me back from obviously to me to get away, them to get away from me and things like that. Um, and I I don't remember really doing this, but again, from the footage, I'm like, kicking at them which again is what we do in training if you're on the floor which you shouldn't if you go on the floor that's like bad news if you're on the floor you can try and kick out lash out wherever it'll be to obviously try and get up get away so yeah kicking out I was like when I watched it I was like well done <laughs> you're still like giving it a go or whatever um, and then pretty much after that um they then sort of, I don't want to say they left me. They didn't. They just went and tried to obviously stop them and things like that. And then there's sort of like this other angle. And I do remember doing this bit quite quite fond, fondly, uh, quite vividly. Vividly. Yeah, thank you. Fondly. Oh, yeah. um, oh, I remember back in the day and all this. <laughs> um, so yeah. So obviously at that point, I'm on the floor. No. It's, I'm not get. I'm not going to be any more use really at that point. Um, and I did feel like I think this is the point where I was like, oh, I'm going to die. And that's the point I was like, no, I'm not a religious person, but literally, I remember literally saying like, please God, don't let me die. Which you know, uh, uh, later on, where did you find out what organs have been impacted by those stabs in the back? So what were, been hit? What was the injuries that oh, you were dealing so, with at that time? I only had really a brush on my kidney. Everything else was fine in terms of the initial injuries. Lucky. And yeah, because I, like, when I was on the sort of, now I'm on like my back basically and, you know, last rites. And at this point I'm sort of like, okay, well, I'm either going to get one in the chest or I'm going to get one in the head as a sort of, finish you off sort of thing and it was weird because sort of okay well let's pl almost like play dead and it was like this other camera where it showed you and, and watching it was like I look dead like you, if you didn't know who it was or if you thought it was someone else you'd be like oh he's dead straight away 
So we'll put that down to good acting ability. We'll say this. But yeah, it did look like I was gone completely. And it's it's weird because you don't really sort of, you obviously know it's you, but you don't sort of go, oh yeah, like that's me. It's it's bizarre. Um, what what was was there any members of the public around at this point? Do you remember or you could see on CCTV what what were they doing? Because so, you, you had your two colleagues. Well, yeah, colleagues. But obviously, they were on duty. You were off. Who yeah. were who were trying to protect you and and protect other people for fighting them off? So was, yeah, I mean, they obviously didn't do the last bit. I don't know whether because they were just going for anyone. So it's moved on basically. Um, I was only on the ground for like it must have been like not even a minute. Um, I remember sort of like I was on my back, laid onto my belly, just so then it was like it was more comfortable more than anything. But it was, you know, sort of get all the blood away from your eyes and all that sort of stuff because there was a lot of blood. Um, and then just sort of from out of nowhere, really, just like two people, just again, members of the public just came over, uh, Justin and Ellen, um, which I didn't know him at the time. They came over and, you know, I was just sort of awake at this point I wasn't unconscious or anything like that I still had a fair bit of wits about me obviously knew what had happened to me I knew where I'd been injured and I was pretty like confident these were terrorists as well um so yeah so they've both come over didn't have to again people could have run there's no harm in there's no sort of like who ran it's a problem it's not that's what you should do they came over again just had to Either they felt they had to do it or whatever it was that told them to do it. And you no, know, thankfully they did do that. So they came over. I was, was again still conscious. I said to like Justin, you know, just because I was to put your knee in my back just to obviously stem any sort of wounding, injury, bleeding. Um and then to Ellen, I was just like, call the police. Uh then I said, <laughs> excuse me, I, I then asked her to call one of my mates, uh, Katie, which she did, and then put the phone to my face. And then at this point, I'm quite calm. Like I've been like, okay, breathe, talk to me about anything. Just keep my mind off it. Just keep me awake. Keep me talking. You know, just so. And then uh, she, I, she put the phone down next to me, like next to that is pool of blood or whatever. And then at this point, I think this is where the sort of the shock adrenaline all these different emotions come out so that every 30 seconds you're up you're down you're all this all over the place so i shouted very loudly what had happened very briefly to katie over the phone uh she then took the phone away after that that's quite a good idea to do that um again from a policing standpoint you go well there's gonna be a lot of people here soon there's gonna be a lot of police here there's gonna be a lot of ambulances here very soon it's not like it's uh in the middle of nowhere we've got no we've got no reception or something it's London. It's going to be here quite quick. So again, just sort of a uh, keep me talking, keep me awake, keep me calm as much as you can, things like that. Um, I think this is something the son picked up on that I he asked me what my favourite song was and I jokingly said, Staying Alive. I was like, still had your wits about you then at the time. But yeah, just random stuff like that really. So, um, yeah, police came quite, quite quick. Um, had sort of like our crime squad, we call them, come over in an unmarked and then had uh, some of the response teams come over, bandaged me up on my back. I think they bandaged my head a bit just again, just to sort of stem any bleeding. Um, you know, at that point, again, a bit of luck because you know who you know the procedure, you know how it works. It is a life or death situation. We're not waiting for an ambulance. We're getting in the car and we're going. So they took me to <laughs> the wrong hospital first because he didn't have an A&E. Literally, it was like 100 metres away. So you thought you would, wouldn't you? You thought there'd be someone there. But no, it doesn't have an A&E. And I was like, okay, that's fine. And then took me to King's. So yeah, at this point, again, still awake, still conscious, things like that. Um, obviously covered in blood. And covered in sick because apparently if you lose a lot of blood, you feel sick or because of alcohol or shock, wherever it would be. I was then sick in the car, fell into the sick, covered in sick and blood as well on the way to the hospital. So 
basically get to hospital quite quickly. Um, and I think even at that stage, it was like, they didn't really know the extent of it. I don't think it was, it, I think it was sort of like, oh, there's something happening, but we don't know at to what level it is. Um, and, you know, it was, I think eventually it was 48 people injured and obviously eight died, unfortunately. So, yeah, St. Thomas, Kings, um, probably Chelsea was probably where they were all taken as well. I was just lucky, obviously, it got found sort of fairly quickly, you know, because this was just over, I'm not saying a large area, but it's you know, it a lot of sort of little alleys, little bits here and there, like you could easily miss someone, especially with all the noise going on. Um, so, yeah, I managed to get myself into hospital again, still conscious awake bit loud I would say I was not happy about what happened is the best way of putting it um, and then by coincidence a complete coincidence there was uh, one of the guys from my who I did my training with his sort of team or unit got told to go to the hospitals because you know that's sort of the procedures that we do in an events like this and just knew, well, I don't know if you like sort of heard the name or things like that of going around and he just came and like, sat with me for like an hour and a half. So it was like, oh, someone I know I can talk to whilst all this is obviously happening to me because at the time, you know, there's obviously people coming in, don't know what sort of urgency I'm at and things like that. You know, the fact that I was awake obviously means I'm probably less urgent than maybe others. And the fact that I could move, that with my legs, I could see and things like that. Again, it's sort of, although it's very urgent, it's not maybe as urgent as others. So yeah, it was probably up for about an hour and a half and then eventually um, got put under and then woke up properly four days later, I think, after that point. I don't know. I've, I, I've forgotten how many people it was that got, that got done that day. 48 injured, 8 dead. I think it was. I can't, I think that was the right number. And it was three three of them. Yeah, it's three of them. So obviously I haven't included them in the people who died because they don't count. So, but yeah, they got shot. Mm. What was the, uh, so what were the, how, what were the head injuries you had? Because you, you mentioned stabbing near, near eyes, forehead. So, three stab wounds, two in the face and one in the neck, 19 stitches which I thought was not a lot because I got stamped playing rugby once and above the eye, the left eye, and that was eight stitches. So I was like, well, it's not too bad. Um, obviously still got the scars from it now, which are fine. You know, again, that could have been, I guess obviously the way they stitched you up, repaired them, however you want to put it, like, it came out really well. Um, you know, there was always going to be something there, but I was like, it could have been much worse in terms of like what was left over, I guess. Um, and then in the back, I think, I don't know if there was, how that was done. I don't know if it was staples or stitches, I can't remember. Um, but when they had to operate, they had to go from the front. So I got a big sort of line going across, up my belly, up to my chest, pretty much. So you went in from the front and then I could operate that way. So they had to remove my spleen. So when they told me they removed my spleen, I was pretty much like, what's that? Never heard of it before. So I was like, obviously I don't need it then. I was like, well, you need to take that medication for it. I went, that's fine. But I was like, I don't know what it is. So it didn't really bother me that much. I know what it's called. I don't know what it does though. I'm sure it does in, it does hormone release and stuff, doesn't it? Like, it's, like, yeah, if it, basically it's for your immune system, Right. pretty much. It just helps your immune system. Again, I was like, I don't know what it is. Um, so yeah, that was a big sort of, that was all stapled down the front as well. And obviously just sort of had, you know, still had bandage on, obviously just like loads of painkillers and things like that as well. So um, people who've had had it before, the morphine button, you get in hospital every 10 minutes, little, oh, that's lovely. Um, so yeah, I think they eventually sort of, I think on the Tuesday, this is the Saturday, I think on the Tuesday, I think I, was briefly like opened my eyes or something like that. I don't really remember what happened, if anything did happen. And then on the Wednesday morning, I think it was, there was like 
my parents were there and um I think a couple of my mates Dan and Katie were there as well. I can't I think that was the Wednesday. And then the Thursday I sort of been moved from out of like I guess intensive care to just a ward. Um and then I yeah, sort of remember that day more, but I was still very out of it at that point. Um I had an incident well I say it was an incident. Uh, it was basically my borough commander and chief inspector turned up and at this point i'm sort of very like excited i guess we'll call it in terms of you know oh i'm alive oh i've got this in me i've got this this and this uh, i've got these like chip buckets here with, like chest drains and all that stuff and i was like oh i've got this uh catheter in as well so I revealed that to them and they were like the commissioner's coming soon can you not do that i went okay so <laughs> that sort of made me a bit more like okay there's <laughs> What was it like? Uh, what was it like when Fia trying to remember the? Inc- you mentioned earlier when you, you you have your version of what happened in your head and you know what happened on CCTV. That's quite quite common. I've experienced that previously. I've mentioned we talked about it previously where I remembered an, an event, completely different chain of events to what other people who were there. And there was no CCTV, but there was they had it right and I had it wrong. Um, um, what was it like? Because I'm assuming as part of the process, you had there was. They need to take a statement from you, stuff like that. So yeah, they did have to take it, but the fact that I was in hospital, it was deemed not appropriate to do so. So, you know, people are going to ask, aren't they? You're not going to be like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not allowed to talk about it for what would have been three and a half months. It's not going to happen until the inquest. Until that was when I did my statement. Ah, right. Um, so people came in and were like, "What's happened?" or "What happened?" and I'll just go tell it really you know again it's sort of like no one said don't talk about it but you know you're going to really aren't you what what people want to know they want to know if you're all right which you are how the hospital's been and what happened so you're just gonna have to bring it out so i think even sort of talking about it very early on definitely helped um again just sort of the the process of it and things like that um but again, it was just more sort of, I'm not dead, which will always be the biggest achievement, if you can call it that, because it is like, well, I should have died and I didn't. So why why would I not talk about that? Why would I not sort of discuss that with people? And it's like, if you're talking, if they sat in the other, like at least like you're with it, you're not sort of like breaking down, you can't talk about it and things like that. It was like, just for whatever reason, it was very easy to. Boy, the drugs helped at the time. <laughs> Um, so yeah, just sort of, you know, had all these different procedures happening, obviously checkups like all the time, um, as you get in hospitals, you know, I was originally in sort of like a, a ward with like four people. And then I think someone high up in the organization had a word and put me into like a sort of a room of my own, which I guess makes sense. Considering, obviously, you know, if you talk about it from a proper, like, organisational, like, procedures way, yeah, that's probably beneficial to do so. And there was press floating around or trying to get in and things like that. So if they pick up on something, they're going to go with it. Um, Because I think they, it got, I guess we could say it got leaked that it was, one. I was one of the people before the Met sort of released the statement as well. So... Someone's probably been a bit naughty somewhere, giving the information that I don't know. Like not from the job, probably from like social media and things like that. Um, so yeah, it was more sort of getting them in there and then you would have someone outside, obviously people who are coming in and things like that. And obviously if I was like, oh, I don't want this person here, they would come in and deal with it. So yeah, um, being, being in that situation on your own, it was weird because it was really nice because obviously it's quiet. I mean, I had visitors all the time. Or it was, oh, this morning we need to do this, this, and this. We need to get this scanned. We need to do this x-ray, MRI, wherever it is. So you're sort of like busy, almost. Um, And then pretty much afternoon time to evening, because there was obviously visiting hours, but they were like, yeah, you can have visitors whenever you want. Um, So if I had my team on like nights, they might come in and things like that. So, yeah, that... That most of the time the day was sort of like 
you're laying in hospital, you can't really get out, but at least you're sort of being, you know, keeping busy as much as possible. Um, Were there any other victims from the attack in the same hospital? Uh, yes, so Wayne was in there. It was me. Wayne was in there. Um, that was pretty much like, you can't go and speak to him. But that is, that's the procedure. And I went, that's fair enough. You know, we didn't know each other at the time. And what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about what happened, aren't we? Which, which one was, which guy was Wayne? Which was he uh, one, so of, the, he was one of, the of the BCPs? Police? Yeah. Oh, he got stabbed. Yeah, he, he got, he got, he got, uh, he got one in the, he almost lost his sight in one of his eyes. Um, got stabbed in the leg. I think there was a couple of others as well. I think it might have been in his hand as well. Um, yeah, he was, yeah, he got, he got done as well, basically. Um, so yeah, I couldn't really speak with him. It was more sort of my dad or someone else would say, yeah, he's fine. Or you would hear how his condition is. And I assume that was working both ways. Uh, yes, there were other people there as well. Um, again, there was not that sort of contact really. Sort of, it was again, it was more sort of like, are they all right? Yeah. You know, that sort of thing. So yeah, being on your own was, uh, it was nice. It's just when it was late at night, there's no one around. That was like quite tough at times. Again, it's probably the mixture of like what's happened, the drugs in your system and things like that as well. So like this, I would listen to podcasts and things like that as well, just because it was almost like you're having a conversation with someone who's there with you. So that was quite nice. And if it was really boring, I'll just fall asleep. So it's even better. Um, but I mean, looking back on them, then days were, they were long. But it was only 13 days I was in for, which given the extent of what happened was quite surprising. Because um, I'd never been in hospital for like a day, ever. Never been overnight. Probably been in there like once or twice before. So you don't really know what it's like. You don't really know what to do and things like that. And again, it's the sort of, I just want to get home as well. Um, so he came out after 13 days, as we then called it, the 13 day hangover as well. Um, got taken home, had obviously still had bandages on and things like that. Um, and there was just basically, like, if you've got any problems, you can just come back in. All right, that's fine. So, um, Six days later, I was on in a car with my mate going to Glastonbury because what had happened is, I think when some of them had come in, like uh, very early on when I woke up, we're like, well, what do you want? And me sort of like joking, he was like, yeah, I have a Glastonbury ticket, please. So they went and contacted Glastonbury and Glastonbury gave me a ticket. And I was like, that's really nice. I probably won't be able to go because I'm a bit injured. But I came out. It was absolutely fine. I felt great. I uh, on the so that was come out on Friday. On the Monday, uh met Triple H, the wrestler, because that was a surprise that had been organized as well. <laughs> that was like if you wanted to sort of like, go like that's like something that you keep and you sort of go, Wow, that that happened. That's like a big sort of like jump in terms of how your mood is and things like that. And that was just like more shocked than anything else. I didn't know it was going to happen. So I sort of had that. And then on the Tuesday, I think I was like, oh, I think I'll be all right. And then managed to find a B&B. &B, so could sleep obviously in a nice bed. So I was like, if I don't feel great, I'll just come home. Or I'll just stay in the B&B. &B, you know, just something comfortable. Um, so, so, well, I say survived. I always say survived. Survived at Glastonbury. Um, which was great. Um, never thought I would make it through to be honest but I did and then two days later woke up in the morning had this massive pain in my back and I was like oh you know like you get back, bad back and you're like, oh, like pull the muscle or done something like weights or running I was like nah this is like almost like it feels like something's trying to get out trying to pump on my back so I was like okay Um, tried a couple of places thought well let's just go back to King's because you know, they said, if you need to come back, you can. So I went there, got a scan. They just pretty much said like, oh yeah, it's just a bit of like sort of infection or sort of 
like build up of various things. What we'll do is just slice it open and take it out and you'll probably go home the next day. Okay, well, that's fine. Complications came from that. What had happened is basically, I guess due to the extent of the surgical procedure and obviously the, the I think this was more the wounds than the damage they did. Um, there was pretty much a hole in my stomach and there was a hole in my diaphragm. So basically everything I was eating was then almost digesting, but then coming out and basically just finding a place to go. Oh my God. So it was in my chest cavity pretty much because this is going to sound a bit disgusting, but I had a couple of leaks from any sort of chest drains sort of holes, which they said might happen. Um, and then obviously it's sort of not found a way out. So then it's just gone to where my back is and that's where it's sort of then built up. So I had like, yeah, just obviously I hadn't eaten a lot because obviously I've been in hospital, not because the food's bad, just because you don't want to eat when you've had loads of drugs and things like that. You're just on nutrient bags or whatever. So um, that sort of built up and that caused a bit more sort of damage internally. Um, so that was the initial one. And then again, it was just like these, like almost if you had like a bucket, it would just be like coming out in different colors. So because what they meant before is basically it would show if there's air coming out of your chest cavity. So if there is, that means your lungs not sort of healed up and things like that. So it was coming out like black. It was coming out like grey. Uh, uh, coming out, how, coming out where? How? Which so way? it'll come out of my chest cavity through the uh, drains, out the drains into this bucket that is made to be for air, and it would fill up of various different things in it as well. So uh, they basically, basically punch, put a bunch of drains on you and left you for it to get itself out, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah pretty yeah. much. Um, so I was like, oh, there's dinner, you know, <laughs> whatever else <laughs> being there. <laughs> You're like, oh. Yeah, don't show it to other people who come and visit. Just try and hide them a bit because it's like, yeah, it's a bit of a, a colour. So, um, you know, it's it is a case of like, well, what is it? You know, which is perfectly sort of understandable. It's not going to be like, oh, yeah, it's just that quick fix, is it? It's like, well, this could be coming from anywhere. It could be this, could be that. So it was, I guess, some at some point sort of a trial by, was this a trial by? Fire? Yeah. Just, uh, it's just like oh, it, you mean process of elimination process of elimination it? thank oh, you yeah, okay, right. yes a process of elimination um, so I went back in so now I've got this big scar down my back where they obviously operate as well so in terms of like lasting damage I've got more bigger scars from surgery than from anything else which I'm like that's probably better so they went back in they sprayed my lung with basically almost like a coating almost I think they said it was um, again and then it would sort of heal with that coating on that didn't solve it. And then that's where the point, I think they went, oh, that's where the hole, the holes are almost. Because uh, there was like an, I don't know if it was an MRI, it's basically one where you go to the big tube thing and it's all like this sort of thing spying around. Cat scan. Cat scan. You can see a cat, M cat, MRI, you got Meg, I don't know. They're all, they're all brain stuff, aren't they? Yeah, it might, have been, a, it might have been a cat scan. So I had to drink this sort of like fluid, which basically took, tasted like, I mean, I like Sambuca. But it tasted like just Sambuca with something else in it. It was like an aniseed sort of flavour. So it was like, you have to drink this because then what would happen, it would then show where it's going. It's iodine, isn't it? Is it iodine? I think it's... Mm, I, I, it's, I, I don't I, think I, it's iodine and they can pick it up in the scans, can't they? See where they, all the fluids yeah, go. Yeah. I might it, be wrong. It tasted shit. Let's just go with that. <laughs> um, so that was... So I did that. I think the first one I did... At the time, obviously the football just started and Chelsea were 3-0 down at half time to Burnley. I went, this is a great day. This is a great day. I'm drinking this and we're losing to Burnley at home. So, yeah, got, got, <laughs> so, I think from that it managed to sort of go, okay, that's where the problem is. So I thought, oh, you know, another like big surgery. So after these other two was, you know, basically like one-to-one -one care for a couple of days where you are basically just like you can't move you can't do anything um but it would be weird because after the after i would sort of go back into the main ward and i had like i shared you know so it'd be like me and someone else in a room which i thought was much better 
because then you had like people walking past, you could obviously see people and things like that. Um, but I was in a wall for people who had like heart bypasses. So these people were coming in and like going, yeah, I'm having a triple heart bypass tomorrow. I'll be out in two days. And I'm like, I can walk. <laughs> I can walk around and do this. I just got a bit of stuff coming out my chest. So that was a bit weird. Um, but yeah, met like a few people and it just, again, sort of like, oh, when there's sort of downtime, there's not people like visiting to the same extent. It's like, well, at least there's something else happening to sort of take your mind off it and things like that. So yeah, I had the, uh, what would have been technically my fifth surgery. Um, and it was all like keyhole. So it didn't really leave, you know, he left like these little scars on my belly and things like that. So I was like, oh, that's a bit better. But that was the one before, like waking up from them, scary. Because I don't know why they did this. I don't know if it's a thing. But I swear I had a tube, a plastic tube, down my throat, into like my belly. So when I woke up, I'm like, like gagging. So I don't know if that's a thing that they do, or it was just imagining it. That was a nice surprise. So you mean so you when you when you you think they did that during the surgery and you woke up gagging from what you had in it? Well, yeah, but not surgery. like I didn't like wake up during surgery or anything like that. It was more just woke up from being not under where it's called under the anesthetic. Anesthetic, yeah. Good with words today, aren't I? Um, yeah, and then after, and then this other one, oh, it was a bit like something like a, it was like Doctor Octopus, like all these wires coming out of me. And I was like, I have no idea what's going on. And the poor geezer, like the porter, like, you know, he's a porter. I was like, what's going, what's going on? And like, I, and no, at this point, I never really sort of got to a point where I like, you know, people get frustrated in hospitals. I can understand that. And I was quite like sort of all right with everything. You know, it's nothing you can, it's not like it's your fault. It's just my body's not, I mean, it's my body's fault. But I was like, you need to tell me. I was getting, I was getting a bit too, like, and I was like, and afterwards I was like, like I felt a bit shit because I was like he's just doing his job how does like it's just because I'm like waking up like oh my god what's going on because I thought wake up in like you know again like a one on one care not getting wheeled away almost so it was almost like no one was telling me anything and that was like a bit sort of like, like what's you'd, going on um, when, when the when the attack happened when the, that the terrorist attack happened you'd only been in the police for three years at that point hadn't you uh, at what point after the attack do you think uh, I'm in the right job <laughs> <laughs> so I've been in yeah three and a half years so I only done so I did like a year on like which like neighbourhoods basically and then did something like our CID slash case progression unit which is not a, you're not allowed to say anymore um, don't worry it's a job thing uh, and then I was on like a response team for like 18 months and like I had Loved that. And it started off a bit sort of like well, at the start because I think it just hadn't been that operational side of things again. Um, but basically, f the last before it happened, like the last six months, like that year was like I just clicked. Everything just clicked, and I was like, okay, I know what happens. I'm used to the shift pattern. I'm used to sort of going in. And I'm used to dealing with things. I was like training for a marathon, so I was getting myself really fit and all this stuff. Everything was like proper going, like all the way and yeah so I mean that took me out for you know, we'll get off we'll, took me out for say about 10 months originally um, you know there was loads of times where you go I mean it's probably still fairly like not as common but there'll be things that happen or things that are said and you go nah what do you mean like I, why am I here almost like it's a bit it's going to sound really arrogant, but it is a bit sort of times you get and you're like, why, why have they not paid? Why have they not paid me off? Why have they not given me everything I want? Because I deserve it. So that's something that, you know, people say to you and you go, oh yeah, that should happen. You know, you sort of get influenced by what other people say and you sort of, you know, when you get frustrated or you like, not just even from yourself, like, oh, like, you wake up feeling shit. Like, I don't want to, why am I doing this? I don't need to do this. But for whatever reason, it's just always comes back like 10 times more that I want to do it. Like, I don't, I know now, and this took a while to sort of figure out, 
my, I guess, end goal was always to go back operational. That would be like, oh yeah, I'm a hundred percent. I'm 90%, but I want to be that hundred percent going back out and doing what I did. So I had, so I left. So after that second bit of hospital, I left after eight weeks. I was in there for eight weeks more, basically came out, had still like some bits attached to me, but I was fine. Uh, and then basically they were like, you just do as much exercise as you feel like you can. So I said, I'll do the marathon again. So from October to April was very much sort of focused on training and running. And, you know, there was obviously a lot of events, recognition stuff, which were fine. Were great. Obviously experiences I've never thought I've had in my life. Um, so you were sort of like, that's your job going to these things and then you can still like do your own sort of like um, recovery. Like you know, I occasionally would go to like, so my base was at Peckham. I would try and go there because then I'll get to the feeling of going back into work, using the gym, seeing people and trying to sort of almost like build up this sort of, I'm coming back part to it. So I think, I'm not, I don't want to criticize anyone for this, but I can understand where they come from. When you're on stage at the Pride of Britain, when you're on the TV, when you're doing these, all these things, and now you're doing a marathon, why can't you come back to work? Is sort of what I guess people might sort of say. And I could, I was very close to being like, that's just taking the piss. But I could understand, like, you look fine you're fit, why are you not back? But I just didn't feel ready enough to go back in terms of just a more of a physical stance at this time because the mental stuff hadn't really hit me because it was come out of hospital, you're fine, you're alive, you can almost run straight away, not quite to the extent I could do. I was like, you lost loads of weight for obviously being in the hospital and things like that. You know, you're going to like, these like even if it's like drinks with like your mates they're all like giving you like everything you're like you're like the biggest thing in the world to them you know you're going to like things that have national attention and you're like oh like this is like i don't want to stop doing this this is great it's almost like a drug you're just sort of stuck on and you're getting all this admiration and it's very difficult to sort of not go oh uh you know i think i've found my sort of humble side a bit but it's very difficult to be like yeah that that's me so I can understand there was sort of like a bit of pressure to come back, but I thought I need to like chill because I've been doing all this stuff and it hasn't really felt like I've had time off. So as soon as I've done the marathon, then, you know, the next couple of days you're going to be aching. But after that, I just dropped completely. What do you mean? In terms of my, because I've been working so hard for that and now it's done. It was almost like, okay, what am I going to do next? So quite quickly, my natural instinct was, okay, I'll go back to work now. So I went and had a chat with like our occupational health. They said, well, you know, they're going to obviously ask you how you are. And I said, I've just done a marathon. I've just, I feel great. I feel like top of the world. Um, I'm ready for this. Without even probably giving it enough, the attention it deserved. So I probably went in about a week after the marathon. So it's like end of April, start of May. So there was a bit of, confusion we'll call it over what my new sort of like getting back into you know you think do a few hours here build up all this sort of stuff like i knew i wasn't going out on the street at that point i was going to get used to being back in the office um i think there was some sort of confusion i was pretty much under the influence that you know i can work not my sort of hours i want but i can obviously build up and then other people were like no you have to basically be on full time next week and I was like, I ain't ready for that. And that really got to me as well. I think I was struggling anyway, but I think the thought was like, yeah, just crack on and deal with what you're doing with. It, what, what, it, what, it got to you that you weren't ready to go back out? Or that yeah, you I, think, to go I back? think I was like a bit sort of like, it'll be easy. Again, this sort of, I'm invincible. I can do every, anything and everything. That why is going back to work an issue? So I think my head was like, not, thinking of not giving it the justice it deserved 
it was like, so as soon as I went in, I was like, <coughs> excuse me. So yeah, as soon as I went in, you know, it was a bit like, ooh, like a bit back here. It's like all this sort of like, oh, like a lot to take in. The thing is with it as well, Charlie, is that no, it was never, <clears throat> it's never going to be the normal again. It can't be. And like with that particular like, an incident like yours, you're involved in one for you personally, like the, the nearly killed, you know, um, other people were killed and badly injured like you were. Um, it, everything, cha everything changes. So no one treats you the same. You can wake up. No one's treat. No, and no one will treat you the same as if it never happened from your friends and your family. You know, uh, he, he, uh, you, you will know this. It's from, you know, they, especially your parents are concerned. They, they probably quite often worry about you. Is he all right? Like mentally, uh, he, yeah, is everything fine? And you got you you got your mates who are like just completely championing. Nothing's the same. And then it's hard for people to sort of understand that, I think. You, literally, everything about your life, all your interpersonal relationships, they have changed in some way, shape or form. And the way people perceive you. And also, it's not just the people that you know now know you. You got the whole of the British public know you as well, you know, and uh, and so going through all those activities, like doing all those those things that are part of the recovery or part of the incident, the you know the aftermath of the incident, Pride of Britain awards, the Queen, the you know, George Medal for the Queen, um, and all the other stuff, work's never going to be normal again, um, and so I, I completely understand it. I can also see how people will find it hard to. To say, well, why the bloody hell isn't he back? Isn't he back at work? It's, uh, it's, hey, it's, and how often do those incidents happen? People don't know how to deal with them. It's like probably part of the confusion at work. They just, it's these aren't regular things that happen that you can just everyone knows the answer to. It's like, hang on a minute, what's the situation here? <laughs> yeah, I always said like, oh, so if someone showed me the book of how to do it, I'd be like, if you get it on an Audible or on a like a audio thing, I'll listen to it, um, because. It's difficult. I mean, it's it's difficult for even, you know, okay, from that situation, obviously how people generally just treat you, there's almost this sort of like a norm for it. Um, you know, what really got, I can't say got to me, what really annoyed me was, you know, just the same sort of questions. How are you? How are you in yourself? And I was like, in your, don't say in yourself, please. It's really annoying. Like, you know, I can understand it from a, I want to know if you're all right. It's like almost like, what else are you going to ask? And things like that. So again, that sort of, it's like, look, if I'm here, I'm fine. You know, that sort of thing. With And there was a lot of, again, you know, this, there is some things that are like, this is in the book. So initially, especially for my parents, you know, getting sort of, you know, while I'm in hospital, all this stuff that's going on in the background, it's like, just tell us the stuff we need to know. Don't like, come at us from like 10 people who tell us the same stuff we just need one person just to be like here's what's going on we're not the sort of people who are like we need to know everything you know some people are some people are like oh, i need to know everything that's going on everything's going on investigation everything's to do with this that and the other it's like oh they were just like we just want our son back at home like that's it we just want to know is he all right yes that is it really what do you want him to do that like, okay we'll just we'll discuss that with him things like that again People, that's not a criticism. That is, if that's in the book, we don't fit the book. You know, some people won't want it the same way. Some people want no attention. Some people want loads of it. So that's, that's, that was fine. But all these things, they're very minute things, isn't it? So, yeah, I guess, you know, I can understand people sort of being a bit like, you know, come back, you're fine. Man. And I thought I was, to be fair. So it was a bit sort of like, you've come back good. And then oh, it was only there, I was only there for like, I think I was there for three days. And these were like four hours. And I literally, I then think it was, I had like five days off or something like that. Just from, you know, sort of managed, I sort of wrote a plan to say, this is what I would ideally want to do in terms of getting back to work. Because I just wanted to be in the office and just like incorporate stuff. I didn't want to be like, have to do, I didn't want to have, say I have to do work but it was like I don't know if I'm even ready to even put my uniform back on at this stage you know again initially I was like I can do everything but very quickly it was like I don't know if I can even put the uniform back on um, and there was like before I had to go in the next time I already sort of decided I was like I don't feel great 
I was like, this is very sort of highs and lows, but these are like highs and lows every 10 minutes. So I'll be sort of like, all right. And then sobbing my eyes out and then I'll come back up and be all right. Then I might be really happy because I've listened to a song that I like or something like that. And then I'll just like almost get to this point where you're shaking. And at that point you sort of go, yeah, something's not right. Like something's really wrong. And I was probably the most anxious I've ever been. I guess almost scared to go into work the next day. Obviously, I wasn't operational, just even going in, the thought of going in brought me to tears. And at that point, I was like, this is, you know, like, you know, you have moments where you go, bloody hell, I'm alive. It's quite a relief. You know, I always had songs that would make me cry afterwards. And there's still one now that is like, oh, it almost gets me. Which song is it? Uh, it is The Queen is Dead by Frank Turner. Because the lyrics in it are just like, it's not even about the queen dying, but it's like, <laughs> just to confirm... Um, it's basically um, he has a friend called Alexa who's in hospital and there's a, there's a line in it just like she's like I'm not dying here but I'm not finished here yet but I'm dying for a drink for a cigarette and I'm like oh, yes me <laughs> sort of thing um, so you have them little moments and obviously like obviously the happy stuff as well happy tears and things like that but this was like as I say like shaking like oh my god like this is like were your, high, were your highs and lows? Were your highs and lows only on that shake and high and extreme highs and lows every ten minutes? So that only happening when you're in, were in your at work. No, this was at home. Uh, okay, right. This is in my what I later found to be my safe place. Um, so this was yeah at home. This is happening now. Again, maybe other things that were happening at the time might have had an influence. So uh, I was about to buy my own flat, which causes its own. Although it's quite easy, it causes its own sort of stress. You know, uh, oh, I don't know how to describe this next bit, but issues with females, we'll call it, um, just sort of all like coming together at once. So I don't know if that sort of escalated it. So obviously I've been like cloud nine, hundred percent, like all like all the time, and now it's like I'm say rock bottom because I don't think I hit rock bottom, and that's not a resting remark either, but like. I've not got to the point where it, I'm just depressed. I'm don't want to be at work. And because it's obviously like the first hurdle that you haven't got over, like going back to hospital is like, it's a necessary, you have to do it. it you've got no arguments about it, but going back to work, it's like, Oh yeah, I'm fine. Right? And then you're not, you're like, well, what's wrong with me? And then that's, this is where this sort of build up comes in and you go like, that's not going right. This is not going right. That's not going to work. Um, you know, everything I've done is not worth anything now because I haven't done this achievement. So being quite critical of myself. And I was like, I think the actual recovery start, like that sort of drop, you know, me going into work and I didn't want to go in. I was so, I didn't want to call them and say, I don't think I can do it. I thought I had to go in and show my face. What was, why didn't you want to go in? What was, what was the, what was in your mind? I think it was just the the fear, the anxiety. I think it? it was pressure. I think there's a lot of pressure. Expe- expectations of you from people? <sighs> what you, what you, I wouldn't say what expect- you worrying about their expectations of you were? I think it was just like, I just don't think I gravitated to the point of like, almost like, oh, I can go into work, but I actually have to do work. And at this point, I was like, I, didn't, I had no considerations for how would I feel speaking to a member of the public over the phone? How would I feel logging onto a computer how would I feel getting to uniform how would I feel you know hearing stuff on the radio even I'm not going out by hearing it no sort of like consideration for that so it's nothing to really it's not like oh it's a mistake again no one really knows what to do in those situations it's just saying I hadn't it's just the entire oh you're, you're back in this thing and then it is that sort of well if I do go out well, what, what happens if something happens not thought of it, not thought of anything like that. Because you can't go out there and be like, oh yeah, let's just deal with it as you did how, before. You mean, how would you react in a situation, if a situation arose when you were working? Yeah, so not even like contemplating, you know, whether, I, I don't think, no, it's easy to say this, but I don't think I would sort of be someone who'd be like, cry in the corner and run away. I think I'd be probably the other way and probably do something I shouldn't, do something too aggressive um, and not be professional and all that sort of stuff as well, which I think is worse slightly than maybe not doing anything because you're affecting 
I guess they both have the positive and negatives, I should really say, for that one, because if you don't do anything, then someone else could get hurt from you not doing anything. But then if you do something, you hurt someone. So, again, none of this was really, like, thought of. Again, hindsight, great. But nothing was really thought of. And so I think just all these sort of thoughts and feelings about what am I actually doing here and what am I actually going to expect it to do hadn't been done. It all just came in at once. Um, fortunately, I made it in and just spoke to one of the sergeants and just said, like, you know, although I, I was crying on the way to work, it's just, just ridiculous. You shouldn't be in that position. You should, If you're doing that, you should think something's wrong. So we just about hold it together when I was being to him I was like I've, I'm, I've got to go I literally cannot be here like I think you could see obviously I was visibly and obviously my mood and things like that um, but yeah I went back again upset on the way home as well um, because you know I feel like I failed pretty much um, and then that I guess May this would have been 2018 not a lot really happened in terms of like things like that were good nothing bad happened it was just nothing good happened so then you're stuck in this sort of i guess rut almost um and then we went away the family and the family went away to greece so i was like oh, okay well that's that that was great that was lovely and so that we sort of missed the anniversary but we flew back on the day and then all i did basically was go up and see my mates at london bridge just to have a drink Absolutely great. And then it was sort of a bit more controlled. It was a bit more, you know, I'm not feeling down all the time. I'm feeling down still, but not to the extent that I was before. And I think that had to do with probably it being nice weather, the fact that the World Cup was on, the fact that I just moved into my own flat. So that's occupied two weeks of your time, doing it up, whatever you need to do to it. So the thing's keeping me busy. And it was almost like that's a fresh start as well. So all this sort of stuff was coming through. And then I think quickly, uh, quite quickly at that point, I was like, okay, I know where I want to go and work. I don't want to go operational. I want to go and work at one of our training places. And there's one quite close to me. And that's where I did my training. So I was like, done. That's decided. I'm doing that. And now it's just going to get to a point of when I can I go back. So... At this point, I've obviously already sort of like spoke to our occupational health, talked about that sort of cancer and things like that. Despite obviously how I was feeling, I wasn't, again, in the urgent category of, oh yeah, I want to kill myself. I was never sort of like, I want to commit self-harm. I thought, again, my way of dealing with things most of the time is laughing, that's laughing it off. So I wouldn't be like, oh, I've had enough harm done to me. I don't need to commit any to myself and things like that. It was just a case of just feeling really low. The anxiety bit didn't really stay, which was good because I don't think I could deal with that. It was just that sort of bleh, depression. And there was that sort of, again, like, I guess it was a bit of the fuck the world at his attitude. It was a bit like, like, why am I doing this? Why do I need to do this? I don't need to do anything. I've done what I needed to. And there was no sort of like, what's next at this point? Like, what do I do next? So we had, um, I think we had the news come through about me getting the George Medal. Again, good news. More good news is, is good. Um, and then there was like the Police Bravery Awards. And there was a more stuff sort of happening around that time. And then me and my mates went to Benicassim, the festival in Spain. Probably one of the best weeks I've ever had in terms of probably because where I'd been but that just solved so many things for me it was just that maybe it was time to get away to just be away with people that have been there for you that you like I'm not going to say love but you know you like a lot um, and just people who are there for you and being in different surroundings you know live music is the best thing ever and the heat and all that stuff and you just think that maybe it was just I needed that had that came back um, just rejuvenated completely rejuvenated Um, so by the time I got into counselling which I think was the next day I was like I'm probably about 80% you know I've been gradually I've been like 20 building up England's World Cup run got me to about 40 
and then you know you sort of go oh, i'm like 80 here all i really need to do now is to be like am i on the right lines am i thinking the right thing and there was a bit of stuff that we sort of we did um in like seven weeks but by the end of it i was like like there's been a bit of useful bits it says about safe place where's your safe place why do you feel it's your safe place and all that stuff um we still did that this um i won't call it hypnosis but we sort of did this uh sort of um i guess test that we'll call it and basically it was just like it was, it was just talking about sort of like one of my like the lowest moments that I had like recently, but that came back all the way from my when I joined the response team, and I just had loads of stress from work in regards to stuff going on, and you know even going like oh yeah I was quite fat then and all this stuff as well and you're like okay that was then how did you get out of it? Well, you dealt with the stuff that would work. You knew it was going to work out. You then got yourself healthy. That worked itself out. You can do these things. And that's what counseling is basically giving you a pat on the back or saying you're amazing almost in certain ways. So that helped massively. And then it was a case of when it got to August or September, I think. I think it was, yeah, August or September. I was like, it doesn't feel I've had any time off which is going to, again, be like, you've had like a year off. Because I all I had to do was just whatever I wanted. I didn't have to go to anything. I didn't have to do anything. I was feeling good in myself. And it was like, I want to sort of just chill out. And then it got to September. And I was like, okay, now it's time to start thinking about going back to work. And then went back in October. Gradually building up. It was all set, laid out, all discussed, all planned out about how it would sort of work and things like that um so again sort of went back in october then we had like the george medal thing we had the marathon gave me an award uh there was some other things going on as well that time again all good news and you know being in that work environment was like it's great everyone's supportive everyone's positive and they still are which is great because you need to have positive people around you you need to have a positive environment to work in um and obviously, if you're teaching new recruits, they're going to be like the most keen people out there because they want to know about the work. So I was like, this is the perfect work environment for me to be in at this moment or well, at that moment then. So, yeah, occasionally there's been the old sort of like dip here and there, but it's just about how you then sort of bring yourself back up and things like that. And I think, especially with like all this, covid stuff now that's obviously like you know we mentioned about sort of what we mentioned recently is like control you can only control the things that you can if you can't control something you just don't have to really worry about it so i think when it first sort of hit and i had to leave work i was like this is fucking shit but then it's like you can't do anything about it so why worry about it it's not your choice is it it's someone else's well it was my choice to leave to go shielding but like you had to you didn't want to die because you wanted to like or get a risk of dying just because you wanted to stay on and do it for the team at that point you can sort of then be like i've done enough i don't need to put myself at more risk um so yeah little things that might happen you just sort of go like i'm very sort of like playing about stuff to the point like okay why are we stressing over that why are we stressing over this we don't need to nothing to do with us we only do what you can if you focus on what you can do, then you're going to be absolutely fine, really. Yeah, bang on. You bang on there. A lot of people spend time, waste time worrying over things that, like, as you say, you can't influence. You don't worry about, don't, you don't, you don't worry about what you can't influence. You just, you deal with what you can do and, and move forward. But going back to that, uh, I mean, that, yeah, that year or so, of, was it, well, about a year that you had off, really, wasn't it, for work altogether? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, if you was, if we say from the day of the incident until going back in, sixteen months. Yeah. If we forget the bit, bit, little bit of a bit, bit in the middle there, but going back to response stuff. Yeah, and it's, it's again, it's an it's an absolute challenge because um, as I, as I mentioned before, I think it's something I'm sort of realizing as you're talking. It's everything, your whole world has changed. You know, 
everything you thought you knew about it has changed. You, you, where you thought you stood amongst your peer groups in society has changed. The way the your relationship again with your parents has changed uh, slightly. We're talking just a little, just this slightly different. The way people interact with you has changed. The way people interact with you or you interact with work has changed completely, just marginally. And so the people that who are interacting with you on a daily basis, they're the same people as they were before the incident. Mm. They're just treating you slightly differently. But for you, every single thing you knew of has just it's shifted left or right one slight little bit, which means when you put it all together, it, it, it is one of those contributing factors to all that, the, the mental the pressure that's exerted on you by yourself or by others, the, that, your anxiety, the depression, the ups and downs, because you're trying to work out what the hell life is all about again and it's not been a gradual change to what it is it's like one incident's done it there you go you you, you wake up next you you, you, open, you go and deal with that incident you have you know after you watching champions league then you next time you open your eyes after that incident the world your whole world's changed completely and you've got to try and re re-understand where you sit within it and then add into that the physical injuries the mental impact of the injuries the rehabilitation all of that side of things Epic. I don't think people appreciate it. I've not experienced anything like yourself. But um, so the closest thing I would try and describe that, if I can analogize it slightly, if that's the right word, is when I w- when I was serving, when I was first serving, um, yeah, I was in the army, and yeah, fine. Then I went to in seventy three. I went on my first proper operation, and that was the Iraq War. Came back from that, and I found it difficult coming back. Not, but not hideously, but it was definitely something to change because people would treat me differently. No, that was just because I'd gone to a place <laughs> and then come back. And, it, and so for, for you, it's like a million, a million fold, a million fold, you know, and then having to have all those emotions and stuff that you're dealing with that sort of make you, they can make you feel like incapable. Like, and that's part of the challenges, but at the same time, everyone is seeing you as a hero. Yeah. And you're the best thing since sliced bread, sliced bread. And yet in your head, it's like, man, I am not living up to the. I am not living up to the standards they think I am here. Yeah. So, mentioned there about sort of things happening quite quickly. Um, I think, I think it was someone at work said about this. It's basically like finding your equilibrium again. So, um, yeah. and I've sort of put this out there with like a couple of like public speaking events or whatever you've done, but just basically saying like you know things change every day, uh, or you know week, month. And it's quite easy to sort of change. Like the weather's changed in the last week. You know, it's like really small. You've adapted to it. Um, You know, you might go, fancy a career change, fancy a different job, fancy, oh, I've got a different role in my job. Uh, Okay, well, that's something I've got to obviously now change. Like my shifts might change or, you know, then we get on to like bigger things like, you know, having kids, getting married or whatever it would be, sort of things like that. But when something so much happens in one go, it is then going, oh, I'm not going to be the same after this. Where is my, because I always thought, oh, back to normal. There's no such thing. It's back to, you have to find a new normal, which takes time. Because again, if you're going, oh yeah, so this week, I oh, like, I mentioned about my friends. I think they did so well in trying to keep me like, not, I wouldn't say grounded, but you know, I don't feel that they really treated me anything different to before. Obviously, you know, stuff you're going to talk about is slightly different because obviously it's like, oh, how was this last week? Or saw pictures of this or whatever it be. That's different. But in terms of like where we sort of stand, I didn't really feel much had really changed. I don't know. They probably think you turn into even more of a tosser. <laughs> I don't know. That could be true. Um, but I just felt they they kept, <laughs> excuse me, they kept me like really in a good place. And I think it did sort of have that like comfort with them and just being like, oh, I can just be me. I don't have to be like someone else or anything like that. Um, so yeah, it's just about finding that sort of, where's your new, new place? Where's your new sort of like, this is good for me here in this position. Um, and you know, that's, again, you sort of, with what I've found with what's happened is, there's always this, like you think about stuff and you and you do it, or you 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 have these emotions and you, you sort them out. I just think it ex- just accelerates or just makes everything like twenty percent worse. So you sort of go, oh, 
I've had a, I've woke up feeling bad this morning. Is it because I'm just tired? Or is it because of this other 20% thing because of this, that, and the other? You know, is it because I'm now, oh, I'm tired, I don't want to go to work, or I'm tired, I don't feel like, you know, as ready as I would be to go to work, There's things like that. And you're like, well, I shouldn't go to work. And it just sort of, you come you're like you're your own worst enemy. <coughs> become like your own worst enemy. So that's why I'm sort of thinking like now, you need to be almost at a point where you go, that's it, deal with it, control. You haven't got control. Don't worry about it. If you have got control, do something about it. Um, and I think even sort of, I would say selfishly again, like you sort of have to work out what's best for you in those sort of like, I would say by the time I went back to work, I was like, I'm just going to focus on me. Really? Um, you know, you, you sort of try and, I guess you, your impulses go up a bit. You think, oh, I want to try a different thing. I want to go. I'm literally just going to see things and go for it. Um, you know, as I mentioned uh, before we started, you know, TV stuff coming in. Getting asked to go on Britain's Got Talent as an illusionist because of your injuries. Yeah, you jump on it because you go, oh, I could do this. And then you get to the point where you go, this is very silly. Let's not do this. Or going on Take Me Out and being like, mm, nah, like, you know, you sort of eventually make up your own decisions about stuff. So you do have this very sort of one way thinking. And I think, I would say, like, particularly, I would say quite recently, it feels like I can, I've, I've got myself sorted. But I don't want to sort of say, sorted, done, leave it alone. It's like, okay, you're in a good place. If you do fall back, you know how to get yourself back up. I think now um, you just need to obviously, you know, people say like you should move on and forget. Well, no, you shouldn't actually. Cause if you go like, that's where I was, this is where I'm now. And you go, well done to yourself. You pat yourself on the back. You got to self encourage yourself. Yes. Be the biggest critic of yourself compared to anyone else, which is fine. Cause you're evaluating your life. You're evaluating your like performance at work or you're evaluating you know, sort of what's good and what's bad. There's nothing wrong with that. But at the end of the day, you still got to have that bit of backing for yourself and be like, I did that, but now I want to do more things. It's like, you don't like, I used to, again, running joke was, oh yeah, met police, completed it, mate. Completed it. What else am I going to do? And there is nothing that's probably going to top that, but there's still things you can do in terms of a work perspective. But, you know, you, you, you've got options on the table still. You can still be like, well, actually, uh, someone's, I've seen a job, gone for it, got it. My decision, I've made the change if I wanted to. Or someone's come and tried to get me a job, not a hint there at all. Come and work for us for 60K a year. Yeah, I will do that. That's fine. What do you want me to do? Nothing. Okay, I'll do that. You know, job available is open. Um, again, you just sort of go like, well, it's almost like you can do anything, but you anyone can do anything as well. Um, and you sort of like go like anything's like quite possible, like you know if someone's if, again it's like, oh, if someone said to you four years ago I'd be like no, that's not going to happen. I mean, it did. Um, so it's probably why I'm quite sort of you know I don't really see the problem of like I don't really see like how people moan about stuff and I'm like you know everyone likes the occasional moan but it's like well, let's look at the positives. Let's go for the, like, let's not think of the negatives. Let's go for the positives of stuff. Okay, what can we do? Can we, you know, change this, change that? Can we make it better? And I think you just need to have that sort of, I think it is finding confidence in yourself, which some people might find difficult, but, you know, you just sort of go like, you know, you're good at, everyone's good at something. You're bound to be good at something. Just keep working, like, and you'll get there. And I think I've sort of found like, my optimum level, I guess, but I'm normally working on like ninety percent. Like I'm happy all the time. It is just when I'm not, it can drop quite a lot. Still, yeah. I think. But again, it is the case of okay, evaluating it. Why am I feeling like that? Not making excuses for it, but it's like okay, this is your time now to think about why you're feeling down, and take that bit extra longer rather than sort of hiding it away. I mean, like you'll be fine. You know, you need to sort of, okay, bring yourself back in a bit and try and evaluate things. So that's the more the long-term 
And that's not going to go away. And it's accepting the fact that, you know, PTSD, whatever, I don't, again, PTSD is like weird because I don't, it's sort of quite a large bubble. It could be anything. But I think it's always something to be aware of that sometimes you might go, something might happen and you're like, oh, you know, I'm back where I was like at that time where I was shaking before I was going back to work, crying my eyes out. You know, I've not got to that point. I've gone down occasionally, but I think I've managed to get myself back up quite quite well. So hopefully I can sort of level myself out as much as possible. That's, uh, that's, that's, it's generalizing. That's, that's life for everyone. All right. Mm. Isn't it? It's, uh, you, we all, everyone's up and down all the time. I think it's unfortunate that in order to get the kind of experience, uh, the kind of experience and understanding that you have of your own, uh, mental state on a, on a daily basis, hourly basis, sometimes, you know, even less is that it's unfortunate to be able to get that generally people have to go through extreme hardship to have that awareness because i've spoken before I, I wish everyone had that awareness of themselves you know you're feeling a bit shitty like you, exactly like you said what is causing the issue can you change it no okay if you can't change that issue to make yourself feel better do something else to bring yourself back up and the other thing is that again with yourself i'm sure when I mean, you talk about in hindsight i when i hit rock bottom and i well, no, sorry, when you go, when you go get re- feel really down, now you 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 understand it now to bring yourself back up. But also, I'm guessing that you're able to see that coming. Sometimes you're able to see a bad time coming, and then be able to sort of try and aim off for it. Yeah, I think the um, the, uh, yeah, I think it's just to being aware. That sometimes you don't. Yeah, sometimes you do see things, and then you sort of like, okay, okay what's the best way of dealing with this? And usually. It is venting in some fashion, not on social media. Shouldn't be doing that. Occasionally that has happened and I've gone, nah, that's stupid. Um, but you sort of go, okay, right, writing things down for me is the biggest thing ever in terms of like, okay, uh, I've felt upset with something. I want to write down why I'm feeling upset. And it can even, and this is sometimes where it does feel like you take it on a day by day basis which very early on when sort of this setback happened, it was waking up, oh, I feel good today. Today's going to be a good day. Uh, oh, I woke up bad. Today's going to be a bad day. And now it is. I wake up fine, pretty much. It will be the it will be literally at once every two months, probably even less than that now. So you sort of try and like plan. I'm like quite planned orientated. So... Or as much as I can slightly, of someone, my girlfriend might disagree with this, but she will say you can't change your plans. It's like, I, I can. It just takes me time to make those changes um, because I've sort of like set myself up for the next like two weeks in terms of when to do things and when to not and things like that. Like, you know, if something spur of the moment happens, it's, it's fine. But it's like, okay, I then have to sort of think about, okay, so that means I can't go to the gym on that day. Or I have to go then and things like that. So I guess that could, I don't know if that's the thing. I don't know if that's normal. That that sounds normal to me, but maybe, you know, extra five, ten percent on because of what happened. Maybe I like to be in control of what is what is happening. So again, that's my sort of, oh, I know what's happening. I can sort of manage it quite well. Um because because the problem the other problem I sort of have is if I don't do anything. I am terrible. I need to be out doing stuff. I need to do something all the time. So I guess people might call that erratic, but you know, I, I can sit down and watch like a documentary. I can watch something on Netflix or Amazon Prime or any other streaming sites that are available. Um, you know, it's fine, but within reason, I couldn't sit there all day and do it. I would have to go out, go for a walk. I have to go out, go to the gym, or recently go to the gym. Uh, you know, I have to, write something, listen to something, do cleaning, you know, wherever it be, I have to do something or prepare for work for the next couple of days just so it keeps my mind occupied as well. Um, excuse me, and obviously physical health ha- helps your mental health miles. You know, doing that marathon after coming out of hospital, probably, I would say probably delayed everything, maybe, but I think if I didn't do it, I would have just sunk into that rut and it probably would have lasted longer. Um, so and I know how beneficial it can be and things like that. So again, just you set yourself challenges, 
like small targets. So my small target every day is to do 10,000 steps. That's my small target. If I can do that, I'm, that's good. I've achieved something. And then we go sort of like, okay, at the moment I'm in the process of like losing like quite a bit of weight. So again, that's like maybe the medium challenge. And then your high challenge is like, oh, okay, um, I want to get promoted. I want to do the marathon properly next year or wherever it'll be. So you set yourself these little sort of challenges and things like that. Cause again, that is a sort of self-motivation, right? Oh, well done. Like you've, you've achieved something for the day. Um, so that's really important to do as well. But it, I think my problem I had like when I sort of had these down parts is like, why do I need to manage myself so much? Why do I need to sort of think about every single thing I do in such like, I don't want to say minute, but quite a lot of detail. It should just be like, I'm going out and doing stuff. And then eventually I can then sort of go like, I can be quite impulsive and I can just be like, you know what? I've just, I've just done that. Whether it's almost like the little spurt of doing something and it's fine. Um, but then it can be times where I guess it almost comes to a point of like possibly social anxiety, something like that. Whereby it's like, it might take me a day to call someone on the phone because I just can't do it. For no reason, what's it? just oh, I just can't do it. Like some people don't like phone people, that's fine. Like I'm obviously a bit like that, but why can't you just do it? And now it's like, those are challenges that I didn't think I need to have, but I've spotted them, I've spotted these sort of challenges. And now it's like, iPhone's like, oh, I can't remember what it even was. I think it was to get like, something about my mortgage. I phoned someone on the phone, because most of the time I do it online. And as soon as I did that, I was like, it's easy to phone people. Obviously at work, before, you would phone people every day, near enough. Whether it be like, uh, like senior like leadership, or it be like members of the public, or it be like hospitals. You know, you're on the phone all the time. Like, it didn't even sort of come into, like, any sort of thought about it. And now it's like, oh, go on, on, to phone someone. That's a bit worrying. Again, it's going back. It, it's uh, like we were talking about earlier, where your whole your whole environment changed. Like, I mean, look as 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 we go on through life, things you 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 change. You know, you change within yourself. You physically you change, mentally you change, all the way until the day we die. Mentally you change, physically you change. Your environment changes as you go on. Like going back, going back to like when an incident like what you had happens and uh, and those events on the day. It, the difference is it all it all change. You're right. <coughs> <laughs> it all it all changes instantly Whoa. so not only are you trying to again that equilibrium it's the environment you're in in your relationships but it's also your 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 brain has changed so i mean those things you're describing like uh, uh having the phone you know find difficult phone people need to do that I, I sort of i understand that feeling but for other people that's their norm that's what yeah. they're always like and 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 you are, it's just you understanding how oh this is this is who i am now this is this is who i am now and that, that's how you that's how you move forward with it. I used to think uh um I used to think that I wanted to just get my get I wanted I wanted to be me, the me I was before. Um so I think right that's where I that was my goal. I want to be the me I was before. And uh I was I went and had counselling and one of my one of my uh one of the guys at counselling with he said to me what I've just said to you there is is that have you considered that you are who you are now? There's no like going. You can't. You can't go back. Like you, you've evolved. You're evolving. Mm. Yeah. Some some things change for the positive. Some things change for the negative. You could make phone calls before. Now you find it a little bit difficult. A little bit of anxiety there, right? And and when he said that to me, he said, "This is who you are now." I I, I a penny dropped for me. It's a good fucking point. It's a good point. So instead of trying, instead of aspiring to be who I was before, which you can't get younger, you can't make yourself any less <laughs> wise. Well, maybe you can make yourself less wise with some narcotics or something, but. You, you, it's about understanding where you are now, and then going right, okay. Like you were saying there, you, you, which you're already adapting to it. You were saying about you now need to, you, you, you value routine. You like to know what's going on, and if if things change, and it takes a little bit of adjustment for you. That's you understand. It's, it's you and your new personality, mate. Yeah. <laughs> it's basically, what it is again, it's just shifted things. Are just shifted slightly and trying to understand who you are and how, how to go forward with it best. But yeah, it's weird. Like I was like, you can't phone Nat West, but you can stand in front of like, you know, a thousand people, or you can go on live TV, or you can like go in every day. Well, not as much now, but like 
go into work normally every day, stand in front of, you know, 16, 20 people and be like, oh, I'm teaching you policing stuff today. And not even like, you might occasionally drop like, oh, I've said that wrong or I've made a mistake there once in a day, but you can't call Nat West and go, how's my mortgage getting on? You know, whatever it is. So it's like, again, you're like, that's a bit weird. So you notice it. You go, why can you do that? But you can't do this. What's the difference? One's easier than the other, you know? Do you, so, ever, do you ever see yourself going back onto uh, patrols? I think I made this decision probably about probably during COVID, sometime during COVID or lockdown. Um, I guess it was always saying, I was like, I don't need to. It was always, it's normally, the, that's normally the question people ask, I would say now, is either when you're going back out or are you going back out or something to do with either tattoo fixers or the queen because that's what they've seen me on and things like that on the what the tattoo fixers tattoo fixers yeah so they I didn't get a tattoo fix I got an original my first tattoo this one here so I got that made so people go have you seen you on that or I've seen you like something to do with the queen okay but yeah are you going back to borough when you're going back out on the street and I'm like oh, I don't know yet and I think I was always sort of like I always have these inklings where it's like, oh yeah, it'd be really fun. But as long as I don't have to do any paperwork, arrest anyone, search anyone, I'll just sort of go out and like, be like, oh, what's going on? You know, that sort of ride along. If I can do a ride along yeah. for 30 years, I'm like, this is great. <laughs> um, I don't think I need to, I think is the main thing. I don't think I need to. And I think, you know, again, every time I sort of go, oh, I don't want to be in this job anymore. My dad, most sensible yeah, he is sensible. Like, just I would say the wise is sensible, and like he will pretty much tell me how it is as well. Um, like you're in a large organization, you can do anything you want. You've got job security. You've got um, basically you've got a job for life. Bit of the arrogant side coming at you. You've got a job for life because of what happened. You know, you still have to earn it, but you know you've got a good pedigree maybe compared to someone else perhaps. So it always sort of brings me around to. The sensible option, I would say. It's um, not arrogant. It's not. I mean, look well, at I mean, that. It's not. I, it can be. Oh, we'll use it in an application. You, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not. But it's not arrogant. You just acknowledging what the situation is, and it's not like, uh, it, you know, it's just one of those situations going about. So it's not. It's not. It's not arrogant at yeah. all to just to you be an objective about what you know your 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 situations. So um, yeah, there's loads of different. I literally in the last couple of weeks, there's departments I didn't know even existed. Because I've actually gone out there and asked. Or I've gone out there and looked for myself. Because all I would know really is, you know, our training, operational policing, and the different units associated with that, detectives. But, you know, the background jobs. Yes, they're not out there doing it, but they are available. Um, you know, someone mentioned about going counterterrorism. I was like, oh, I'd probably be quite motivated to go into that one as well. Um, but even just like you know, logistics or something like that. Yeah, it's not going to be like as exciting as it could be, but you're still making a difference just in the way that you can. So, you know, even from knowing what the job's like to then coming out of it for so long, you just then almost have to find that go, well, why do I need to go back at from a, just a general sense of, not that my work is easier now it is easier in certain things in terms of time you know the shifts are better you know there's different sort of pressures now i'm not saying that it is anywhere near as difficult as cid or team but there still is enough of a challenge for me doing it because if you would do it properly it can take time like if you do it properly some people don't do it properly and i'm quite happy to say that on this and if it gets released, some people do not do the training job properly. Some people do. And fortunately, most of people I know do. So we know who that is aimed at. So I'm quite happy in doing what I can there. But I know eventually that's not going to be a 30-year thing. So where else is out there? And that's probably what the stage I'm in now. Talking about promotion, talking about sort of looking out where else is out there not exactly getting into contact with people, but just trying to, okay, what, do, what does this do? 
What does this department do? She might be like, oh, th does that exist? I didn't know it even existed. Oh, that sounds quite interesting. And then getting your name out there. You know, my name is a bit more out there, say, than other people, but you still have to go and ask. You still have to go and, and like put yourself out there. You can't just get given stuff as I keep was like sort of thinking like, hey, just get, give me everything because I deserve it. No, yes, you have to go out there and get it. And I like that sort of challenge and that sort of going out there and doing it for myself. It's, um, good, it's good there because you're, you're, you're fully aware of the God complex some people develop when stuff yeah, happens and, I mean, and, and, and they fall into that routine of they get given everything so then, then in the future they expect it to happen. You know, uh, no, mate, it's, uh, it's, mate, it's been great chat, we're, we're like an hour and, hour and three quarters. Have we not, is there anything we haven't covered? Are you um, to cover? We'll just have a quick sort of, uh, obviously the events that happened on Friday um, at Croydon custody. Um, there is a Just Giving page out there. Please donate. Um, it's an unimaginable thing that's happened. Uh, just ask, obviously, everyone support each other, in, especially in the, in the job. Um, yes, there's going to be anger. There's going to be upset. But let's look out for each other, okay? If we look out for each other, we can help each other and, you know, continue to do what we do out there because I'm not operational. A lot of people are. And, you know, just keep up the good spirit as much as you can, really. Mm. Condolences to Sergeant Matana's family and yeah. friends. Absolutely. Um, I'll put that Just Giving link in the in the, in the the blurb underneath the uh, podcast, but yeah. it's doing well as well, I think. I yeah, I think it was up to 60 thousand as of today yeah. um and yeah um if you want to as well as you know if that's not an incentive enough a little tiny bit of incentive on top of that is uh doing the marathon again on the 4th of october but i'm only walking it so don't give me any money if you're going to give any money to anyone give it to to sergeants just yeah. giving page definitely okay i've that link yeah um mate been a pleasure good luck with everything Thank you. And um, good luck with the marathon. How does the marathon work? It's just people do it on, the, on their cells in London. The so, uh, yeah, basically they're going to send an app um, and then they'll basically just track it as you would say, like Apple, Strava, Fitbit, do the same thing. They just track it, basically just do whatever route you want to do. You have all day to do it. Um, I'm not in the condition to run it and I don't think I have enough uh, motivation to run it just because I can. So I'm, I'm going to walk it um, and my dad's decided that he's going to come and walk the last few miles with me. That's good. So I was like, he was like, if you want to, if you want me to, it's fine. I was like, it's not nothing to do with me. If you want to walk that far, it's up to you. So yeah, hopefully he'll be there at the end. Right, cool. Right. Good luck. Thank you. Cheers, buddy.